Welcome to Ethics in the Computer Age. This is week one, lecture one, part one. What does it mean to be human, as you'll see as we go through the course, is the central question in philosophy. In part one of lecture one, we're going to specifically be looking at some of the key concepts that we will be using as we analyze material throughout this entire semester. So with that in mind, let's get started. One of the key players in the 19th century, and even today, was Charles Darwin. Though I disagree with many of Darwin's conclusions, the intellectual framework within which Darwin worked is incredibly important for what we will be doing this semester. We're going to come back to Darwin in subsequent, subsequent lectures, and we'll talk more about Darwin's life. But I do want to make one point before we begin, and that is that Darwin was intensely conflicted, <clears throat> caught between a very conservative mother and Erasmus, his grandfather, who was exceptionally liberal and iconoclastic. This tension between the conservative and the liberal is mirrored in the fact that Darwin very much wanted to avoid publishing his theory of evolution. And were it not for a letter he received from Alfred Wallace in a subsequent meeting between the two in Paris, <clears throat> the theory of evolution as we now know it may never have been published. <clears throat> so let's look more closely at Darwin's theory of evolution. Let's talk about the implications of that theory and how that ultimately will apply to what we will be talking about this semester. For Darwin, the process of evolution begins with one-celled organisms, and it ends with human beings. <clears throat> the process or history of evolution can be defined as the process of increasing complexity. There are consequences to um, the development of more and more complex organ organisms, one of which, for Darwin, is the loss of instinct. <clears throat> now, this is where we move into a very gray area as far as Darwin is concerned, because he never <clears throat> ultimately spells it out in these terms. On the one hand, you could argue and be well within Darwin's work <clears throat> that only humans are conscious. On the other hand, <clears throat> you could very much read Darwin as arguing that as instinct diminishes, consciousness increases. <clears throat> that in fact, as complexity in any organism increases, there is some measure of consciousness. This is called panpsychism. <clears throat> I think there is more evidence to suggest <clears throat> that in the end, <clears throat> Darwin endorsed panpsychism. There were many reasons for Darwin not to do this, one of which is when he was an undergraduate and attended a lecture of the Plinian Society. <clears throat> one of his friends, who definitely influenced Charles Darwin, delivered a paper endorsing panpsychism. <clears throat> the paper was stricken from the minutes of the society. Darwin, who was intensely cautious, would have been extremely cautious about arguing for panpsychism. <clears throat> Additionally, 
We should note that the cautiousness of Darwin led him to elect to erect mirrors in his house. His study was in the back of the house, <clears throat> and he was so concerned about the impact of his theory of evolution that he used the mirrors to see who was coming down the driveway for chance someone would be coming to hurt him. So complexity and consciousness. Let's look at this in human terms. We could also argue that as we reach primates, there is the beginning of a loss of identity. Fundamentally, we as humans have no concept of who we truly are because we emerge at a point in evolution where instinct is minimal. I'll repeat that. Humans emerge at a point in evolution where instinct is minimal. <clears throat> and therefore, the question of what it means to be human is not simply a philosophical concept. It is, in fact, a biological concept. Let's look at that more closely. <clears throat> In strict Darwinian terms, and when you read Eric Fromm, you're going to pick this concept up again because Fromm, despite being very critical of Darwin, is also very dependent on Darwin's argument. What we're going to call the human question, what does it mean to be human, is as much biological and therefore psychological as it is in fact philosophical and theological. Because humans emerge at a point in evolution where instinct is minimal. And therefore, the sense of who we are is problematic. When you read Eric Fromm, this is part of Fromm's conversation about humans emerging at a point in evolution where we see ourselves as part of the physical world, but also apart from. This tension is driven by the experience of death. Again, you'll see this in chapter 10 of The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, <clears throat> quite clearly outlined by Eric Fromm. So what's the implication of this? Well, we can't wander through the universe not knowing who we are. There's no empirical way to answer this question, except, of course, we can map our genome. And that will, in fact, tell us something about who we are. But the complexity of the human species is mirrored in the fact that we have three brains. The reptilian, 
the mammalian and the hominoid, which is essentially the neocortex. As you'll see later in the semester, the tendency is to see consciousness as a function of the neocortex. I think that's wrong, that ultimately consciousness, based upon Darwin's analysis and other analysis by um, evolutionary biologists, is that it is a function of our mammalian brain, and that to some extent, in one way or another, a cat, a dog, a horse, all share some measure of consciousness. If this is the case, as you'll see, then when we get to the conversations we'll be having about artificial intelligence, we have to question whether or not some of the fundamental assumptions, i.e. that consciousness is essentially logical and rational, is true. I'm going to argue that in fact, that's not true. That in fact, when we look at it that way, we ultimately answer the human question in a way that's fundamentally flawed. So how do we answer the question of what it means to be human? Well, Fromm offers an important insight. Um, and if we look at the fact that Eric Fromm was trained by Freud, he would also have known the work of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, who built on the work of Carl Jung, both argued that the foundation of all of human culture has its roots in mythology. Myth, rather than false stories, represents our first articulation, our first understanding of the world, of who we are, what it means to be in this universe. We're going to argue in this course that morality is a function of a given society and culture. That a given society and culture is based upon a mythology. What I'm going to refer to as the foundational The tendency in our culture when we're facing ethical and moral problems is to pass a law. That doesn't work. All effective social change begins by changing the foundational mythology. Let's look more closely at that. If we take Fromm's analysis seriously, and by the way, these are going to be my words, not Fromm's, because I find his terms to be a bit more obtuse and difficult. Um, we can argue that human societies fall into one of three categories. They are life affirmative, life neutral, and life negative. A life neutral society incorporates elements of both life affirmative and life neutral. An example would be the Apache. 
left to themselves, they were life affirmative. <clears throat> when they felt threatened, they very quickly became life negative. So what is life negative? For from a life negative culture embodies three values. Sadism, masochism, and necrophilia. For Fromm, necrophilia is not literally loving dead bodies, but the fascination with death, destruction, and violence. <clears throat> By definition, all life negative cultures are aggressive, warlike. racist and sexist. This is not an indictment against European cultures. This is a, an indictment of all life negative cultures, including Russia, India, China, Japan, Korea, um, the Aztec, the Inca, the Maya, the Dogon, the Yoruba, all the same. If they are life negative, they are also, by the way, going to be male dominant. <clears throat> they are constantly at war, and not just at war with other humans, they are at war with the universe. In some shape or form, all life negative cultures require and extensively use technology. Technology becomes the tool for refashioning the universe in human form. Technology becomes the tool for refashioning the universe in human form. As it says in Genesis, humans were given dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the whole of creation. Life affirmative cultures are based on the idea that the universe is harmonious, ordered, balanced, if not good, at least benign. Chaos is temporary. and easily fixable through ritual, as opposed to the life negative world where chaos is the rule of the day. Chaos, uncertainty, everyone and everything is a threat. If you think about where we are, we are a life negative culture. Our values, drive our need for technology. One of the points I want to make now that we will repeat throughout the course of the semester comes down to this. The idea that technology, the idea that technology is objective. is false. Think about Microsoft releasing an AI-based bot to the world and the bot comes back in short order as racist and sexist. All technology is based upon and reflects. a society's answer. To the human question. 
male dominated societies produce technology that is male centric. Racist societies produce technology that's racist. The same is true for scientific inquiry. Science is always framed by the culture in which we live, which implicitly offers an answer to the human question. We'll come back to many of these ideas throughout the semester. But I'd like to shift at this point to a conversation about Thomas Kuhn and the book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn's logic is very simple. A paradigm is a worldview. Oftentimes that paradigm is implicit. Which is to say, not written down not in any way articulated, but it is taught, inculcated, inbred, woven into the structure of a given society. Now, understand that Kuhn would put this in terms simply of science. If you grow up in the post-Newtonian world, for example, you're going to learn all the assumptions of the post-Newtonian world. But the point that I want to make here is that having grown up in the United States or wherever you grew up, if you did not grow up here, you are from the time you were born taught this paradigm. The function of science paradigmatically for Kuhn is to verify that the principles, assumptions, hypotheses of the paradigm are in fact true. Well, he would prefer workable. Inevitably, in the process of testing and verification, anomalies are discovered. An anomaly is a phenomenon that does not fit the paradigm. Eventually, the sheer number of paradigms, I'm sorry, number of anomalies, becomes so great that the result is a crisis. Theoretically, theoretically, at least in science, when that crisis ensues, we enter a period of time where there are competing paradigms. One paradigm wins. As Kuhn points out numerous times, the paradigm that becomes the dominant paradigm is not necessarily better. For example, AC1 over DC, when alternating current AC, is far less efficient than DC. So why did we move to a paradigm of alternating current? Because the people who espoused the use of AC were simply politically more powerful. So don't assume that because a paradigm has survived, that the paradigm was necessarily the best choice. One of the points that Kuhn makes that's absolutely critical for us to keep in mind is that no paradigm fails or becomes successful 
because it is true or false. Paradigms fall or rise because they are more workable. So the idea that the earth revolves around the sun was more workable than the idea that the sun revolves around the earth. This sets up a situation in which competing paradigms are a fact of life. The Republican and Democratic parties both offer very different paradigms. They may overlap, but they're very different. Their understanding of what it means to be human is different. Their understanding of how society should work is very different. In terms of Kuhn's analysis, neither one is true. It's just a question of which one is more workable. What you're going to see as we move forward in part two is that Kuhn failed to account for one major eventuality. And that eventuality is this. What if a paradigm A simply modifies itself or B what if a paradigm simply fails to fall and to this we can actually add a third one what if there are no competing paradigms? What if we enter a paradigmatic crisis and no clear successor is found? What happens? Well, in part, you're going to see what happens because that's exactly where we are. We're caught in a world in which we have competing paradigms, neither of which is really um, competent or workable enough to pull forward. And part of the problem is, as you'll see in part two of this lecture, that the original paradigm, which comes from Aristotle, has been modified now for over 2,500 years. In the late 19th, early 20th century, when the Republicans and Democrats split, they maintain at their core the Aristotelian view of the world. One final point before we end this lecture. In part two, we're going to be looking at the events of the 16th and 17th century. I'm going to leave you to think about this before we begin part two. We are dysfunctional. We can't solve our moral problems. We are not yet able to really think about the consequences of the moral problems our technology offers because effectively we live in a, in a split world, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. We're still living in the world of the 16th century. Empirically, experientially, 
scientifically technologically we're living in the 21st century effectively we are 500 years behind computers are not possible in the 16th century artificial intelligence is not possible the internal combustion engine is not possible I could go on but I trust at this point you see what I'm talking about and over the course of the semester we're going to continue to see this play out okay when we come back we're going to be looking at um, a couple of key concepts within the Darwinian model and we're going to fast forward from there to the 16th and 17th century if you have any questions, I would urge you to email me, come to office hours, and we will move forward from there. Thank you, and um, again, part two, shortly.